Welcome to Northwest Air Guns. I'm John, and uh, welcome to another episode of Obscure Air Guns. Uh, in this particular case, we have a Sterling HR81 made by Benjamin Sheridan, and they're, they're kind of an odd air gun. Uh, there's not too many around, but they're not uncommon either. And I thought it might be interesting to at least a few of you uh, to take a look at this and uh, talk about some of the history, uh, that type of thing. And then we're also going to um, see how it shoots. We're going to shoot a target. Uh, we'll check the velocity on it and trigger pull, stuff like that. So, and I had one of these years ago, uh, and I had to sell it. I had some things happen, and I basically had to sell off some of my, uh, I don't know if you call it a collection, accumulation, and I had some nice ones. Uh, and this was one of them, and I've kind of wanted to have one ever since. And so I've kept my eye open for it, and a fellow brought it in, uh, and it uh, the rear sight didn't work. Here's the original rear sight, and the rear sight didn't work for some reason, and it didn't have any uh, inserts here in the front sight. And so, uh, and turned out he didn't really want it anyway because he wanted to shoot uh, turkeys. And this is a 177. And uh, California, you're not supposed to shoot turkeys unless you're 20 caliber and above. So there's that and, uh, and the sights. And we put a scope on it just to kind of check it out. And he didn't like scopes, he liked open sights. And his buddy had a Walmart special 1,500 feet per second something, and that's really what he wanted. And so I went ahead and bought this from him and uh, gave him the cash, and I gave him an old uh, Cummins truck stop um, under lever too. So at least he had something to shoot and a couple pellets. So that's the story behind how I got this. Now there's some kind of unique features, or odd features, I guess, if you want to get down to it. This one has uh, a loading port here, and the bolt is operated back here. Spring-loaded, comes to the back, opens up the port here, put your pellet in, close it up. But it's not cocked at this point. It's an under lever, and you cock it by Pulling back the latch, and now you're ready to fire the gun. So there's two operations. A lot of times uh, with brake barrels or even under levers, uh, you cock it and load the pellet in kind of one operation. This takes two. One nice thing about this is that you can decock it as well. Just pull the trigger gently let the uh, caulking handle back and now it's uncocked. The safety on it is here on this side and it's set by pulling the safety back. Take the safety off, just push it forward. Well, first, let's do a little bit of history. I've got our uh, blue book of air guns. This is the uh, fifth edition. It shows the uh, Sterlings here with the HR-81 and then the uh, deluxe model, I guess you'd call it the HR-83. But they don't give you a date on when these things started to be produced. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm sure they sh uh, hear it says the last manufacturer suggested retail price was $250 for the HR81 and we'll we'll take a look at that too in a minute because I've got a price list from Benjamin that uh, disputes that. We also took a look here at Airgun Digest 3rd uh, edition and Jess Galen had a nice write-up on the uh, HR83 and according to this, uh, the Sterling started in the UK. Sterling made machine guns and military weapons over there in the UK. And somewhere around maybe 1975, that era, 
uh, they came out with this air gun, the Sterling. Uh, and, and again, it was HR-81, HR-83. So he's got a nice write-up here, and I'll try and put a link to this article uh, so that if you're interested, you can take a look at what Jess Galen had to say. Then, early 80s, uh, Sterling sold everything to Benjamin, and here's a 1988 catalog. So Benjamin kind of sat on this for several years, and then they came out, uh, you know, if they, if they purchased Sterling in 83, 84, they didn't come out with the rifle for sale until about 1988, so there was a lag in there. And this says that the original design was magnificent and unique in many ways. All you'd expect in the first air gun from Sterling, one of England's most famous arms manufacturers. And now we've moved it all, the prints, tooling, and the equipment to America, and we're making the Sterling air rifles even better than before. So in 1988, uh, they started offering these Sterlings um, here made in the United States with tooling, parts, inventory, or whatever uh, they got from Sterling in the UK with some improvements. And they talk about it's got the genuine Lothar Walther barrels. And I don't know if the UK versions had that or not, but once Benjamin started making them, they added that or made sure that they had that. Uh, better internal valving, I'm not sure about that. I don't know what they would do to the internal valving in a spring piston gun like this. Uh, improved charging lever, okay. Better stocks, positive safeties, and more. And the safety, I think, is something that was added by Benjamin. Um, and you can see there was that cutout that uh, allowed for it. So it's kind of a redesigned Sterling that uh, Benjamin came out with. And uh, the, uh, the one thing that was consistent between the two is that there's no adjustments to the trigger. I mean, you could take it apart, work it over or whatever, but there's no uh, user-friendly uh, kind of adjustments that you can make. And you can see here this came with uh, the uh, rear sight, or you could go with the peep sight, the Williams peep sight. This is actually a Beeman peep sight that I installed later, or after I got it. Or you could get the scope. Now, in terms of pricing, Sterling HR81 standard rifle listed uh, at $272. And uh, that's in 177. Uh, if you got the HR83, the deluxe was uh, $386. And you fast forward from there. Oh, and by the way, in this catalog, there's no mention of 20 caliber. But by 1991, they had added the 20 caliber. And the price in 1991, HR81 was uh, $341. And if you got it with the Williams peep sight, it was $481. So that's a pretty big difference. Uh, one thing also that this gun, when it when it showed up, it didn't have any uh, inserts for the front side, and you can see that the front side had originally three uh, inserts that you could use there with either the peep or the open side. Okay, well finally, Benjamin Sheridan was bought by Crossman. This is the earliest Crossman catalog I have. All I know it was sometime after 1994 when uh, Crossman bought Benjamin, and there's no mention of Sterling anywhere in here. So they, they dropped the line altogether. All right, well, I think I mentioned earlier that these things came with this front sight, and there were inserts that you could get for it, or that came with it. I don't know if you got all three or just one or what, but this one didn't have any inserts in it at all, and it, the way it works basically is you just pop the insert into this slot and then snug it up with uh, with this locking nut here and I thought well you know I could just maybe swap it out for something like this this is uh, off of a 
cheap Chinese diopter and just take this one off, slip that one on. But the problem is, if you look at this, the uh, this is a male dovetail here. I don't know if you can see that very well. And this is the female on top of the gun. This is the opposite, where this is the female. So you need to have male dovetails here. And I don't want to go to that much trouble with it. So I went online. I went on to the uh, Gateway to Air Guns forum. And a fellow mentioned there that he uses a Viroc or HW uh, front side inserts. And they fit. And this, uh, this opening here is about 585 thousandths of an inch. And I think the HW uh, inserts are 575. So it should work. And I looked around. I couldn't find any Pyramid Air has them or has them on their website, but they haven't been in stock. And I've been looking for several months now. So uh, I went ahead and went to Nibs in the UK and they had a set of the HW inserts. So I went ahead and bought them there. Just be done with the whole uh, search mission on them. So that's the front sight. Well, being that we don't have any front sight inserts, we're going to shoot this uh, for the target uh, shooting using a scope. And I've got a little uh, 3 to 9 Leopold EFR here. We're going to use that. And the gun, it actually has scope grooves milled into it here, one on each side for the scope mounts, and then stop holes here. So it's set up for a scope. If if that's what a person wanted to use, and that's how we'll do it when we shoot the targets. Okay, well that's about it. Um, we saw that we can get uh, eight, eight and a half foot-pounds energy out of this thing, so it's not a powerhouse, um, but it was pretty consistent. The uh, accuracy was pretty good. I mean, we're in the middle of kind of a blizzard here in California, and we're not used to being cold, so um, I only ran one type of pellet through it, and we got that group that we could cover with a quarter, I'm sure. If uh, the weather were better and I wanted to spend more time out there with it, we could, we could get those groups down quite a bit. So I think the accuracy is there. The trigger, a little over three pounds, but it's real consistent. Um, so all in all, a pretty nice rifle. Uh, and you have to wonder, you know, why wasn't it more popular so that uh, Benjamin Sheridan or Crossman actually discontinued it altogether. And I think what happened was with those prices um, we saw in the three, even over $400 range, you're competing with the Viroc. If you recall, uh, Beeman was importing R1s and R9s and that type of thing. And they were really more suitable as a hunting gun or 
that type of thing. They're heavy, but not overly so, and they had quite a bit more power than this. This weighs in at almost nine pounds, uh, and to only get eight foot-pounds out, out of it is, is kind of anemic, I guess I would say. And that's the other side of the equation. If it were a target rifle, um, there's better options out there for that. In that same price range, you could get a FWB 300 or a, maybe one of the Diana, Diana 75, something like that. There's a whole bunch of target guns, competition, 10 meter guns that are uh, better than these, more accurate, easier to cock, easier to shoot, um, better triggers. And again, in that same price range. So I just think there wasn't much room in the market for this type of a gun. So that's about all I know about this uh, rifle. And some of what I know might not even be correct. But uh, let's wrap this up and move on to the next project. So thank you for watching.